gradually, then suddenly. And it seems like the occurrences that are happening right now in the macro world are trickling over into everything. And there was, uh, I was having a discussion with a friend of mine this morning, Stephen, he talked about, hey, have you taken a look at this uh, documentary, which goes with the 2008 financial crisis? And he said there was a, a specific part with Bernanke and, and just how close we were to the ruination of the entire world. And I thought to myself, first of all, I gotta, I gotta check that out. And the second thing was, I wonder how close we are to an entire banking collapse. So to get to what I'm talking about, this is the actual documentary and it's pretty good. It's from Vice. It's the untold story of the 2008 financial crisis. And what Bernanke says in this can be summed up in this minute and a half clip. And I want you to, when you listen to this, think about how things are happening or unfolding in the macro environment, which is a mess right now. So take a listen to this. Hank Paulson and uh, Chairman Bernanke came in. And Chairman Bernanke uh, said to the group, if you don't give Hank Paulson what he needs, within 72 hours, the entire banking system of the United States will fail. And then the world banking system will fail on top of it. One of the most sobering periods I've ever experienced. Hmm. You gotta be kidding. I mean, wh why are we first meeting now? We've got 72 hours. If anything, I think I might've understated in my predictions how bad things were actually going yeah. to get the secretary described what they wanted to do and so we've tested many models and we have what we call our break the glass plan we were going to buy troubled assets you know not sure how but we were going to buy troubled assets about every 15 minutes majority leader reed would say how much is this going to cost a hundred billion dollars no 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 hank said no 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 we knew it couldn't start with a t i couldn't ask for a trillion I wasn't going to be unable to get unspecified again. And so the biggest number we thought we could get was 700 billion. And we thought, you know, 500 billion sounds, sounds big, but 700 billion, 500 billion, 700 billion. Many people don't know the difference. Basically, we wanted it to be as big as we could get without spooking Congress so it blew up on our face. Yeah, so just listening to that, I mean, you just see how close we were to entire global meltdown. And then that got me thinking, I'm like, well, how is this compared to what's happening right now? We just saw some pretty big banks. We saw Signature and Silvergates and Silicon Valley Bank and Credit Suisse. And now we're seeing other banks. And there was a report out a couple of days ago, close to 190 banks could face Silicon Valley Bank's fate, according to a new study. And if you want to have this broken down for you, you know, quite simply, check out Guy's video in Coin Bureau. I'll link that uh, in the description. So for me, I think things are happening and it took a long time, but uh, now things are catching up to us. So I can't tell you what to do. I can't give a financial advice. I'm not a financial advisor. However, when we take a look at, um, I always feel like it's a pretty good idea to diversify. So I have a lot of cash, 24% in cash. Some of that is in banks, some of that is on uh, 1% is in stables, 5% in DGEN, Masterworks, in land and property, and my Amazon business, other businesses, 15% in staking and crypto IRA and, of course, stocks. So not all of these will collapse, but maybe one will. And I don't know which one it is. So for me, I get a little paranoid. So I say, well, I better protect myself in the best way I know how. Now, you are free to do whatever you want to do. This is just what I am doing. And the question that I have, actually, was how did we get here, quite honestly? Because, I mean, everything was going pretty well, but now all of a sudden we have this issue. And if we take a look back, I mean, really take a look back. This is Ben's site in the Cryptoverse. I try to steal as much information as I possibly can from his site. You can check it out. Link's in the description. But uh, debt to GDP ratio. And when I took a look at this, I'm like, you know, this is a pretty good indicator of what is going on right now. And just so you know, the higher the debt, the GDP ratio, the less likely it is the country will pay back its debt and the higher the risk of others lending to that country. And did you know, here in America, I can't speak for every other country, but our debt to GDP ratio was uh, pretty good, 38% in 67. Then we hit uh, some pretty lows at uh, 30%. We never dropped below it, but in 74, in a recession, in a recession, mind you, we're at 30% debt to GDP. 
hit another recession, 30, 31. Volcker came out and avoided the Great Depression. <clears throat> of course, because what are we going to do? We're going we're gonna to drop some rates during the recession as things come about and maybe do a little money printing. And then here it goes up. And then we have a little bit of a recession here in the 90s. No big deal. Didn't last too long. Maybe print a little bit of money. And then as economic outcome does pretty good, here we are at the GDP, 64%. Well, we can, we can pay some of that back. This is in the 90s. Good old days with Bill Clinton. He actually did a pretty good job. And as we drop down to uh, 54% at the GDP, unfortunately, a recession hits us, cut and spend. No re recession hits us here in, in uh, the Great Recession. And this is when we really turned the printer back on and didn't stop and didn't, I mean, just started cutting rates and never really raised them. And we could see the effects of what's going on. Now we have a debt to GDP over 100% here in 2014. It just kind of went off the rails. And of course, uh, nothing like a little pandemic to uh, turn those printers back on. And now we got the GDP at 134%. And we couldn't really do too much because right now today we are sitting at debt to GDP maybe 120%, we are arguing over the debt ceiling. So what does that mean for crypto and digital assets? Well, I gotta tell you, I think some of the uh, old whales were correct. This is uh, from looking at Bitcoin. You can find this also, link in the description, it's a free, free site. And whales that have held, not whales, or just, excuse me, uh, Bitcoin wallets, we'll say, which they probably are doing pretty well if they're holding over 10 years, let's be honest. Over 10 years, we can see right here that uh, as far as 2018, you know, take 10 years back, Bitcoin's created. This is when it starts. And you would think that they would just start selling, but no. And some people say, well, Rob, you don't understand because all those people back here, they lost all their mnemonic phrase. I don't think all of them lost it, but even if they did or didn't, you still got a whopping, as of today, almost 15, 14 and a half percent of all the Bitcoin wallets out there have held Bitcoin more than 10 years. And we can break this down even more. So if we want to look, take a look at seven years to 10 years, we can see that here that's around 5%, five to seven, three year, five year, two years to three years, one year to two, six month to 12, three month to six, blah, 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 blah. One day to one week and 24 hours. You can still see that up here, the majority are people over 10 years holding Bitcoin, and it kind of goes down, down the line. But that's not the interesting part. It's interesting because I like to see longevity. The interesting part was here, the one-year holdaways. This is how things have just been held in wallets and how they've been unspent for quite some time. We're at an all-time high, 68%. The next closest time frame was 63% in 2020. Next closest was in 2016. You will see that, uh, of course, during uh, all-time highs, people will start spending Bitcoin. They'll start selling, moving. That's just the nature of the beast. We can see it happened here in 2013, here in 2017. And of course, here in 2021, double top as it goes down. But again, we are at all-time highs. And then also, I think people are accumulating quite a bit. Addresses with a balance of one Bitcoin or more. That could be one Bitcoin. That could be 10. That could be 100. Just depends. And those wallets really started to accumulate when the Bitcoin price dropped to around 19, 20, 17,000, somewhere around here. And you can just see that it just went up vertical. And now as the Bitcoin price has raised up, I don't think it's really the price anymore. I think the reason that we're almost at 1 million addresses that hold more than one Bitcoin is because of the issues that we're seeing with the banks and the collapse. I don't know about you, but I have gotten a ton of questions and comments from people who are outside of the realm of crypto and digital assets, family included, who are like, what do I do with my money? Because if these banks collapse, what does that mean? I think that's where things are flowing into. And then the next question I get is, is this a good time to buy Bitcoin? Well, for me personally, I think the worst time is never. But if we take a look at historical risk levels for Bitcoin, you can see that today, as far as the riskiness, it's not super risky. The Bitcoin risky risk assessment level is 0 0.48. What does that mean? Well, if we take a look at time and risk bands, 
this is the majority of the time the Bitcoin is in this band of 0 0.3 to 0 0.4. Right now, it's actually increasing, a little bit more risky, 0 0.4 to 0 0.5. But around here is a pretty good time, I think, especially over here. On the far left-hand side is when it's less risky, potentially. That's where I like to pick up more of my Bitcoin. But as we go over here, things start heating up. And when you get to these risk levels, I mean, look at that, 0 0.9 to 1.0, only 18 days or 80 days from 0 0.8 to 0.9. That's when uh, things are getting a little overheated. Right now, we're over here. Looks pretty good. And then actually, if we take a look, historical risk levels for other stuff like Ethereum, Ethereum's actually heating up 0 0.55 ADA, much, much farther down. So less risky, 0 0.2. BNB, all right, 0 0.4. Solana, less risky as well. So again, I can't show you everything, but uh, that's just something that you can find in Ben's website. I like to see these things and kind of assess how risky things are. So right now, when I talk to family and friends, again, I say, I can't tell you what to do. If I tell you to buy today, it'll probably drop like a stone. But I always tell them, diversify and time is your friend. Anyhow, let me know what you think about that in the comments section. And then just to finish this up real quick, AI. And we'll get back to, to, to crypto in a bit, but AI is, it's fascinating to me. And I think this was uh, really interesting because in a little bit, we're going to talk about how Jeff Booth used AI to ask chat, chat GPT where things are going. So, but I'll get to that in a second. This is from Cooper. And he talks about how that uh, chat GPT-4 saved his dog's life. His dog got diagnosed with a tick-borne disease. He had serious anemia. Her condition seemed to improve, but after a few days, things took a turn for the worst. He went back to the, uh, the veterinarian. They ran some more tests. They couldn't figure it out. He took all that information, all the lab work, stuck it in chat GPT, and chat GPT spit out a couple of potential diagnoses. He went to a second veterinarian and goes, look, this is what it says it could be. What do you think about, there's this term, uh, immune-mediated hemolytic anemia. And the veterinarian said, yeah, that's actually could be what it is. Let's, let's run some more blood tests. And that came out positive, gave him the appropriate intervention. Dog is fine. So to me, chat GPT is not going to replace a vet or a doctor anytime soon. But I find it fascinating that it was able to save that dog's life because the first vet couldn't figure it out. So if you're looking at that, there's a link in the description. You can find ChatGPT. It's free for now. Who knows how much it's going to be in the future, but you can ask her any question. That's something you can't get from like a Google. And what Jeff Booth did, crypto OG and talks quite frequently about Bitcoin, is he asked ChatGPT a question. He goes, look, where are we going to go in 2035 as it relates to crypto digital assets, Bitcoin, as it relates to AI, central banks, and the you know potential bank implosion. So he used Midjourney, ChatGPT, 11 Bank Labs to make this video. It's two minutes long. I am not going to play it because it's frightening. But there is a way forward and a way out. I am going to link that in the description. It's just called Ch Jeff Booth Scary AI Prediction. You can check it out and go from there. And uh, that concludes that part and lastly i just want to say thank you everybody who showed up uh, this week there's there's steve from into the or the san juan smokehouse as we walked the uh shelter dogs again i'll be leaving uh puerto rico for a couple months going back to texas so i urge everybody to go over there to amigos de los animales on sundays 8 a.m to 9 a.m walk the shelter dogs they appreciate it you get exercise and everything's good but that's it for today so look i know a little bit long but uh, I think a lot of good information out there. If you like today's video, give it a thumbs up, like it, consider subscribing. Everything to talk about is time sensitive. So that concludes today. Now we'll get into a little Q&A, go from there. But thanks so much for stopping by. I appreciate it. So let's jump into Q&A.